Chamber is um, an online mystery that mixes game, social, and film on a single website. And it's also a PowerPoint, which we're waiting for. Ah, here it is. That's the landing page. So um, I'm the creative director. My name is Christian von Speck, and Frederick will tell you a little bit about the business challenges in it. It starts here. Um, since 2001, I've directed and produced over 30 online stories for learning and entertainment and recruitment and so on. And along the way, in 2006, we basically discovered that we could do one story on a single site by putting mysterious film files into a social network and then letting you progress through them or choose between them with game mechanics. Cloud Chamber is now finished. It's the first of them where we're actually asking for user payments. So this is financed by the Danish uh, Film Institute. And basically, the users get the first two levels for free, and then they're asked to pay about eight pounds for the rest of the experience. We're launching in the first country in August, and we're looking for partners. So if anybody wants to talk, we're ready. The components, well, there's the documentary part, which is basically 30 um, film files taking you from the smallest particles to the atmosphere of the Earth, to the boundaries of the solar system, to the galaxy, and all the way back to the beginning of the universe. So as you're progressing through the story, you're basically learning and getting an emotional relationship with how the universe works. Now, what draws you through it is a very, very personal story, which is fiction, and which is told as found footage, you know, like in Blair Witch Project or something like that. It seems as if the fictional characters have recorded it, and they've left it behind. And here we have a story about rebellion against a father, an overbearing father, a girl who's investigating the death of her mother 20 years ago, and something about a signal from another world that's been kept a secret for all those years. Then the third component is the music. We've licensed electronic music from bands like Burial and Trandemuller and so on. So as you progress through it, you're really in a very ambient headphone experience. And this is backed up by the game component because basically this is a 3D WikiLeaks. So you are basically navigating through a data visualization landscape with the files, the media files, are buried and where you are looking for them. And this is the trailer. So it's fiction, it's documentary, and it's also transmedia, and it's very much a personal story. This is my parents' wedding photo, and it's really a story about being a child of hard science. My mother is a microbiologist, and my father is a geneticist. And there was no religion in my home. I don't know if you know it, but biologists are the least religious profession in the world. And the Danish are the least religious country in the world, so I come from a dark, cold place. My grandparents were extremely religious, so you can imagine the Christmas dinners were interesting. So this was basically how I was brought up. We're completely alone. It's all cold atoms and, and you know, gravity and stuff like that. So we gave these lines to Gustav, who also doubles as Mr. White in James Bond when he's not in cloud treatment. And I basically talked to astrophysicists for a couple of years making this. And until 80 years ago, we basically thought the Milky Way was the entire universe. And there's 100 billion stars in there. so. You can imagine it. And then the Mount Wilson Observatory went up in the 30s, and we started seeing a few flashes outside. And we thought, OK, so there's a few stars outside our galaxy, except it turned out that these were galaxies too. And the last time we counted, there's 100 billion galaxies, each one with 100 billion stars. 
So what are the chances that we're alone really? I mean, no matter how rational and cold you are, there's got to be something else out there. Otherwise, you're really very, very pessimistic. So the way the experience takes you through this is that you get to the landing page here, and you can see the trailer, and um, you can register and connect. And then um, you're basically flying into this 3D WikiLeaks. And this is just footage from, from level one. And basically, the higher the mountain, the more important the file. So it's really like a graph showing you that that file at the top of the mountain is the most important file on this level. So this is a film file that we're getting close to here. And if you open it, basically it opens up a console like Facebook. So you can see the film. You can start to discuss what's going on in the film. And we've really written each of the film parts, which are just three to four minutes, very specifically to ask questions rather than to answer them. So I think starting here. This is one of the first episodes that the users uh, reach. Maybe I can ask you over at the console, excuse me, could I ask you to use the mouse to press play? If you just, you have to take it into the screen and find the play button. So basically, it's found footage. It's, the footage is actually shot by uh, Fabian Wollenweber, who directed The Killing in Denmark, and his photographer. And, um, we have um, Gethin Anthony in there, who was Renly Baratheon in Game of Thrones. We have Mr. White from James Bond. And we basically have the production value of an indie feature film. And I'm not gonna play the entire episode for you, but really, the story follows on three levels. These three young people, maybe you could take the sound down a little bit. These three young people discover that the signal is coming down through the atmosphere in subatomic particles. And basically, it reacts to electronic music. So we really have an excuse for making Renly Baratheon into a DJ and for the users to actually rhythm action through the database trying to figure out what happened. So we have 10 of the films. We have uh, 10 video diaries. We have 80 fictional documents, diaries, scientific journals, emails, and so on. And then we have the documentary materials as well. What you're seeing here is level one. So the actual point of view you're flying through is like this. And then you can zoom out to the God's eye view and see the map level up there. So as you can see in, in, uh, in level one, there's five different files. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. And you're basically unlocking them by being social in the same way that you're social on Facebook. It's not difficult. It's not a game in that way. If you invest time, you will progress. So we've basically stolen the map from World of Warcraft and the difficulty level from Farmville. <laughs> now, the really big challenge uh, that Frederick, uh, Frederick will tell you a little bit more about in a minute is, of course, getting people to pay for something like this, because they're used to not paying for Facebook, they're not paying for Twitter and so on, at least not with money. They're paying with other things, of course. And the way we're going onto the market right now is that you go, you go through the first two levels, and then at the beginning of level three, there's a paywall. So we're giving you the chance to familiarize yourself with the product, and if you like it, then we ask you to pay. We're expecting the price point to be about eight pounds for the rest of the experience. Now there's 10 to 15 hours of entertainment in there, and um, you will basically whack into a cliffhanger here, so of course we would very much like to make um, season two. But what you also discover as you progress, I think there's five files here, there's 10 here. When you get to right here, there's 30 files in a single uh, level. Is that as you progress, the database is breaking down around you because this signal has somehow gotten into the films. That's why the films are noisy. That's why the data is corrupted. The mountains are breaking down and you basically discover that you're actually traveling into the signal as you travel into the story. And that is the creative part. So what we're really aiming for here is to create a, an online experience as every bit as emotional and engaging as we know traditional media to be. Um, we have production values that are, are getting to the point of the um, professional feature film. Our producers have produced 30 or 60 feature films between them, and this is their first move into, into digital. So we're really working on the edge here and getting to the point where the next challenge is how do we distribute it? Okay, so um, now we've heard Kristen tell you about the uh, new artistic vision behind Cloud Chamber. So in combining uh, interactive storytelling, combining 
documentary footage with fiction, social media, and game aspects, we've created a story meant for basically the internet. Um, now, coming from a film world, traditionally we've been told that the internet gave us problems. Basically, the internet gave the opportunity to easily share uh, film, uh, both documentaries and fiction, um, basically threatening the business case of, um, of traditional filmmaking. Here, however, we have used the advantage of the internet to, to our advantage, basically. We know that we will experience that people will grab the film parts of Cloud Chamber and put them on YouTube and share them on, on other media. But in our view, that's good. That's publicity. They need Cloud Chamber. They need to log on to our, uh, to our server in order to discuss with the other users. And since our filmed parts, they raise questions rather than answer, answering them, they need to be within the Cloud Chamber universe in order to get the experience that Cloud Chamber offers. Had we been a traditional movie company producing a traditional feature film, we would have had the advantage of solely focusing on production, and then whenever the product was finished, we could hand it over to the established infrastructure, right? To the distributors, to the sales agents, and whatnot. And we would be quite certain that they would sort of take our product and bring it to the, to the viewers, to the interested uh, viewership. However, we are not. So we cannot use the traditional chain that the industry over the years has developed. Yet we face the same problem. We have a product. Our company, Investigate North, has produced Cloud Chamber. We would like our viewers to see it. We also need the viewers to pay for it. I mean, we need the money so that we can produce the next, the next season of Cloud Chamber or the next project. But we simply don't know how to find these people. We know they're out there. We know that they like it. We've tested it. But we need to find them. Had we been any other company producing a new product, a physical product we would like to sell, we had to find a main shopping street. This is the main shopping street of Copenhagen, where we are based. And we would know that during a day, so and so many people would walk down the street, walk by, past our shop, and we would guess that you know, a fraction of those would enter our shop, and a fraction of those that entered would end up buying our product. So that's the challenge we're facing. We need to find this shopping street on the internet. So the way that we've cracked it is to enter into partnerships. So we are looking for partners that have traffic online, but that want to retain their users on their website, and that they're looking for content and high premium, uh, premium content uh, to, to offer their viewership online. So in short, Behind Cloud Chamber, there is a new artistic vision in how to tell stories online. This artistic vision has brought both challenges but also solutions in, in terms of how we run the business behind it, um, which was, um, yeah, I mean, a solution to, to, the, to the piracy, but yet again, a problem that we cannot rely on existing infrastructure. Now, Chris and I will be happy to take any questions you may have. Um, so please, shoot. So, I mean, in comparison, I mean, maybe it's also worth saying that in comparison to a, a traditional movie or any other traditional story, um, we used to be the, letting the director sort of cut the story, right? So in our, in our universe here, we have three different stories, basically. We have a father-daughter conflict, we have a love story, and then we have a sci-fi story about what the signal is, where does it come from, where does it origin. Um, now, if I find the love story interesting, I can spend more time dealing with the files that has to do with the love story rather than the sci-fi elements. And if you feel differently about it, you can spend your time differently. So in that sense, it is a deterministic story. We all have access to the same files, but our experience will be different because we'll spend time and discuss and engage differently within the, con uh, within the content. So there's a question over there and a question over there. Let me get the roving mic, please. You're going to have to talk loud. I blew an eardrum two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing it at about 25%. 
Yeah, I was just, when you talked about the business model and you talked about the, the shopping street in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. I just wondered, you kind of stopped the presentation at that point, and I was just wondering, um, that analogy or metaphor that you're using, mm -hmm. I'm just curious, I want to throw it out there, is it really the same as a the marketplace, really the same online in the, in the sort of more virtual realm? And, Maybe the currency is different, and maybe there is something other than money that possibly could be used. And I'm not sure how far you'd explored the idea of of that kind of thinking. I'm just wondering, though, if you could just expand a little tiny bit more on the business part. It was just starting to heat up. Mm -hmm. So obviously, what we are, I mean, we've created a story, right? So we would like viewers to engage in the story. So that's the main objective. Um, there was earlier on a question about, you know, how do you actually measure whether you, you have made a success in a transmedia project, right? And one would be viewership, and the other one would be, well, have you actually created a story that people are worth, find worthwhile paying for, both in, in terms of money and in terms of time spent? Um, uh, so, um, I don't know if that sort of gets at your question, or if... if I mean, you said this as if there's one thing, th something. You have, all you have is a paywall, mm -hmm. right? And so that's... Okay. Okay, so I mean, I'm just saying... Sure, fine. yeah. Right? I mean, I've so branded I've, content or, you know, yeah. I was wondering if you, if you had sort of explored, like, other kinds of opportunities. Yes, we're, we're working on other kinds of, of uh, opportunities as well, um, yeah. Um, like, I mean, branded content, branded partnerships, uh, things like that. As well as sort of traditional... Uh, TV sales, uh, if, if you please. Yeah. There's also the possibility that the ads that we run for it become presented by Nescafe or whoever. We really, we've been talking about, we don't think we want to put brands inside the fiction because it will ruin the suspension of disbelief. But outside the fiction, being associated with brands in the same way that the movie of the night is presented by Mercedes or whatever, we don't see a problem with that. Um, what's the price and how many users do you need to break even? So we have, um, for this particular project, we have received quite generous funding from the Danish Film Institute. So the development of the product as such has been paid for. Um, so what we are looking to cover is our operational cost and the coming projects. Um, so the price point is uh, about uh, eight pounds for the entire, for the entire ten levels. Um, yeah. Um, and how many users do you need to break even on your costs? To be honest, we, 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 are, um, we don't know how it will be received also across, across borders. As you see, it's, it's English language. Um, so we will probably need to translate it in some countries. So that, I mean, that will obviously change the, uh, the break even point. Um, yeah. There's one over here. Catch. Uh, <clears throat> have you thought about um, introducing quite a successful model that works in the app world, which is to have in-app payments or in-app rewards? Because uh, I know that works for, I think, um, there's a lot of entertainment games, like car games that have been released, um, where you go in, you buy yeah. sort of different parts. Well, the, pro the problem with that is that our assets are quite expensive. We have a full feature film crew um, doing the filmed assets. And uh, in Farmville, they can introduce a new farm, and one graphic artist can build it, and you can charge five pounds for it if you like. In our case, we have to write the script, rustle up an entire feature film crew, and so on. So that doesn't really work for us. We can't just say a new hat equals new revenues. So we end on a cliffhanger, and we would very much like to do a level two. But our immediate strategy is to position it as premium content and say, this costs money, the entire experience costs money. Um, maybe in the future we can combine them, but at and the moment we don't see a way. It's also a different type of entertainment. Um, apps are typically sort of you know, short time span entertainment. This is like a book. You really need to you know, invest time in it in order for you to, to enjoy it. Uh, so it's also in, in nature different from an app. Well, games in apps, people spend a lot of time on games. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, yeah, the, yeah. I, I would see that as a as maybe a better a better mm -hmm. fit. Well, there is there is one other consideration, which is that 
we're working quite heavily with identification, as you do in a book or a movie. And a constant pulling people out and putting them into a transaction mode will break that identification. So, you know, in the immediate design process, we were thinking about the same thing, but every time we put it in, it just broke the illusion. Suddenly, I'm not, you know, interested anymore in why she's telling the boys a lie. I'm interested in how much does it cost. And so the story starts to fall apart. So that was another reason. For but actually, we built in features This that is the timekeeper, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's one last one. Thank you. Con congratulations. It looks absolutely great. Um, I'd be curious to know how much funding did you get? How much did it cost? And is this a completely new idea, or did you get inspiration from somewhere else? Uh, I, think it, I think we're at about 1 million euros, a little bit below. Most of that we got from the Danish Film Institute. They basically crossed off one feature film from their uh, production budget and let us make this instead. And now we have a private investor that we're working very closely with who's bringing it to market. Um, the last words from the private investor is that uh, he believes in this and he wants to make more. So fingers crossed, we'll be back in a couple of years with the next one. Last question, how, much, how long did it take to make? I've been working full time on this for two and a half years. But it probably took 15 years and all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Should we just get oh. from over there? Uh, it was just a continuation of the question before, really. But I mean, it seems strange that you're going with like such a hard paywall. You know, I mean, you mentioned the metaphor of it being like a book. But books are things that you get into over time. And your approach seems to be, we're going to give it two chapters, and then it's take it or leave it. Okay. You're either completely cut out cold, mm -hmm. But the way that all of the tap and wait games are moving towards is that the longer that you play, the more you get engaged. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, you know, it's literally instead of eight pounds, it's here's 99 pence here. And you think, oh, 99 pence, that's fine. But okay. the more you're involved, you know, the more you're committed. So the a bit more elaborate story is that actually we have features in game that we thought could be in-game purchases. We may want to test that. Um, you can buy the you know, entire mystery for about eight pounds, or you can buy each part, you know, one at a time for slightly, you know, for less. Um, and you get the first part, two parts for free, so you sort of know what you're getting. Um, but the main thing is, you know, that's exactly, you know, it's, it's correct, and it's a testable hypothesis. You know, we've never tried this before, nobody has, so we're really looking to, to you know, stress this and to learn a lot. And luckily, we can change things and see how our, how our audience responds to that. And if you get that second season that you want, will you charge again? Or will that, the I mean, have the whole thing? By that time, we have learned you know, how the audience responds to the pricing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's probably going to you know, be different from this. Um, but that'll, you know, that's the journey we're we about to set out in. The great thing is that we have an investor who understands content, who's in we can test and change and test and change. I don't know how long we'll be able to, but we have it. And then I have to say, it works for eBooks. You know, I don't know if you read eBooks on, from Apple, but 80 pages in, he knows what the mission is, he knows where he goes, bam, paywall. I've bought a lot of eBooks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.